No <laughs> fucking way. You are so right. That blows my fucking it's mind. It's fucking <gasps> insane. That's crazy, Wait. Ian. Captain's Pod, Stardate 510722.1. Welcome aboard the Starship Enterprise, and thank you for joining us as we take a brief shore leave from the world of cinema sins to explore the universe of Star Trek. I'm your Captain Ian Whittington, and she's fresh out of warp cores after dealing with an isolytic tear in subspace. It's Ambassador Danae Hughes. Yeah, listen, it was a big situation. I've uh-huh. got it under control. Everything yeah. is fine. Mm-hmm. I definitely need a vacation and a shower. The most important thing is that you're through running from these bastards. That's the that's the thing to remember. There's always another bastard waiting for me to run from them, mm-hmm. though. This job never ends. Mm-hmm. I don't um, know what I'm talking about. Am I doing good? You're my, doing my, great. You're okay, doing great. Okay. I, that was a few <laughs> references from Star Trek Insurrection, which is a movie I absolutely love and most Star Trek fans despise. Um, oh. It gets like the argument thrown at it of yeah, it was just a like a longer episode of TNG, and I'm like fuck yeah, like gimme, that's exactly what I want. Anyway, how are you doing now that the fabric of time and space has been rescued by a warp core ejection? It's that weird time after a massive accomplishment where you want to tell everyone that you're the one responsible for making sure that everything went well, but then you also are okay, <clears throat> okay, quote unquote, being humble about it. Oh rubbish, and just. <laughs> realizing that no one's ever really going to know that you were the one that did it. Um, And so I'm kind of wrestling with whether or not to make an announcement Mm -hmm. or sort of try to massage and manipulate a couple of conversations with other people so that they do it for me. Oh, okay. Slash reconcile that this just may never, like no one may ever know, but you captaining Ian Whittington Mm -hmm. and potentially podcast listener at home i i just have to be okay with that my captain's log already says that it was my idea i came up with it executed it and and did it and you were actually against the idea um you wanted to do something stupid like vent the main shuttle bay and i was like nope eject the warp core let's do it you Sorry. shouldn't tell me these things <laughs> eh, <laughs> it's <know>? fine <laughs> i controlled the transporters i just switched out of like show mode for a second oh no and went into like I realized that I'm the one responsible for making this mess, you know, like I'm the one that fought for you to be able to do this captain's pod show. And now here I am being tortured by it. And, but you come back. And it's my fault. Every week. You know, this yeah. is my fault. That's what this is coming down to. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to disagree. You brought this on yourself. You're like, hey, really Ian, did. he sounds fun. Let's let's work together a lot. He won't be annoying in the slightest. No. Yeah, I probably should have thought about that a little longer. Uh-huh um yes well too late now you're you're on it it's a, it's a, we're in space we just have to too late. It. it's a five-year mission it's in space that's it <laughs> it's a five-year mission okay good so we have a little bit we've got just a few years left on your contract great uh, okay wait wait no okay it's a 17-year mission <laughs> <laughs> hoping this gig can hold out until till i need to retire apparently i'm gonna retire at the age of 47 that's yeah that's likely so we're continuing with our run of Star Trek Lower Decks to Insta-Podding and insta Um This week is, uh, the episode is A Mathematically Perfect Redemption. Redemption? Is that the word? Is that the one? Hang on. Let me double check that. That sounds weird. Yep, no, that's what the title of the episode is. A math- Mathematically Perfect Redemption. What the hell is this about, Danae? Hmm, sounds like engineering is involved. <laughs> You're just like, I want nothing to do with this. This sounds like math and engineering. I'm out. There are certain personalities who need to have like almost like the perfect equation before they can sort of relax their brain, mm-hmm. which is why relationships sometimes are like hard because it's not transactionary. <laughs> yeah, you think there's not like At one least, plus one equals fair. It's not always transaction. No. But uh, yeah, I'm thinking that this sounds like it might be a personality that can't argue with the outcome because mm. it's it's an it's an equation. It's interesting. So who would isn't that it? be? Who um, would that be on the on the team? Tendy or Rutherford? I like. I imagine I'm Tendy Rutherford. actually being quite, <laughs> being quite like this has to add up. This has to make sense before I can move on. Maybe a bit Boimler. I'm thinking it's. You know they haven't had like a strong Boimler episode since no, the season Jesus. started. No, so we, we are overdue mm-hmm. for one. So I'm gonna say Boimler, Rutherford, 
aka Robot Boy yes. and my Green Girl. Your Green Girl in that order. He's the best. Yeah. So before we go into it, I'm because I flick through Twitter. That's what I do. There has been some controversy with this episode, and as much as like Twitter controversy actually exists, because. Not as many people as you think are on Twitter are actually on Twitter. So the very loud negative voices are probably just five people. But this is like, I've, I'm have i going to say reasonable fans. Reasonable fans whose opinions I trust, it's split them down the middle. They're like, this wasn't for me. This is a massive departure from what Star Trek usually does. I didn't enjoy it. Or Whoa. I love it. This was wild. It was crazy. It really worked. It's what is like, wild and crazy for Star Trek? Right? Like, they pretty much break their own format a lot. But this one apparently goes really sideways. So I'm really intrigued to see if I like it or and how they do that. Like, forced sex with a candle? Uh, I mean, breaking right? sexual history and, and, and negative um, abusive patterns from an outside alien source via Beverly? Yeah. We've done a that, lot. That's a lot. That's a big departure. Deep Space Nine is a big departure. Um Docking hmm. is a big departure. Okay, listen. That okay, was last no week. We're moving on week. from no it more this docking. week. No more docking. Um, no more docking talking. How, however, if you do want to see some clips of me having a breakdown <laughs> talking about docking, um, they are available on the Captain's Pod's Twitter. Like anyone would be like, oh my God, yes. I'm, oh. I, that's what. That's what's going to be the barrier to entry for Twitter for me is yeah. going and watching Ian uh-huh. <laughs> react to a docking conversation. Hey, or you can do it on Twitch. You can come and see us on Twitch <laughs> oh and it'll be God. there as well. Man, that was fun. Right. Okay. With that, we will see you guys for a full debrief in 10 forward after we have watched episode seven of Lower Decks. To the Cerritos! Welcome to Ten Forward, the part of the show where we grab a something from the peanut hamper and share our immediate <laughs> thoughts and feelings on the episode we just watched. Most important question first, what would you like replicated from the maniacal AI? All right, I'm going to go with something that's not a drink. I'm going to break my streak and just mm-hmm. say I want an, a- an areola candy. Areola candy, nice. Those little yep. candies, the that little pink peanut candies? hamper. Re- yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's try one of those because I- you know that peanut hamper was drugging everyone so oh let's yeah just that's give like it a go. straight like crystallized heroin <laughs> to giving it to all of the kids here you go little kids who knows what, about what that you? was what are you gonna have from me peanut hamper? Um, i just want like that warm beam that peanut hamper puts all over the eggs it's just like a really nice warm warm blanket that's so funny that i was thinking lovely. about that too and i was like how would i have that but that yeah, did look nice i just want that that's fine there's a few things that looked kind of quote unquote nice in this episode nice can we just say straight out of the gate here? Yeah. This is Stardust City Rag. This yes. is that, you know. Yeah. Th- this is the one that if people find our podcast and they're just kind of curious about our thoughts on a season uh-huh. video, this is the episode people are going to be like, okay, but what did they think about Peanut Hamper episode? Yeah, this is an infamous one. This is a... And I... To say that, like, this is a departure from what Star Trek does is a fib. Like, this is still a standard Star Trek thing. It just focuses on a different character. Like, this this happens in Star Trek. Um, so, anyway, before we dive into this bonkers episode, um, we find ourselves reunited with Peanut Hamper, which is a sentient exocomp um, who... I'm not going to say evil, but is independent and was... Self-centered. Yes, ejected from the show, I think, in season one. Um, And yeah, we reunite with them to see where they've been over the last two years and and what happened as they discover a planet of what we believe are pre-warp birds and shenanigans ensue as she tries to find her place in the world. Um, (laughs) Right, Danae, we have a choice here. We can just dive into the episode, or I can give you a brief history of exocomps. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the history of exocomps. So, Peanut Hamper appeared, I think, in season one, season two, it doesn't matter. But um, th- that isn't the first time the exocomps have appeared. So, the exocomps are a TNG creature. Um, they they only appear in the one episode, and basically there's this, like, um, this new fancy mine um just a laser drill thing that's going to extract all of this like super duper power source for this planet of aliens and starfleet are like really really invested in it and they're like hey if this works we're going to roll this out to a ton of planets but there's tons and tons and tons of problems so this genius scientist has invented this little ai robot with a built-in replicator that can get in and out of trouble basically 
get into like the small places where nobody else can get into, diagnose the problem, replicate the nose piece to fix whatever they want and then get in and out of there so they're disposable they can just go in there get blown up it doesn't matter and they can fix any problem data is suspicious that they're actually sentient and that they're actually alive because they were he'd like they were commanded to return and refused and then realized that the problem they were asked to solve wasn't the right problem found the problem saved everybody and came out and then there was another problem where they were sent in and refused because it was too dangerous. So data is just like, we can't enslave these they have choice. creatures. They have a choice. They have free will. And um, basically, nobody believes data. And they agree to like stop using the exocomps, but they don't go any further with it. And there's this huge, huge, huge meltdown at the mine. And Geordie and Picard, I think, are on the station and they're stuck. The only <gasps> way to save them is to use the exocomps and Data refuses. <gasps> and he overrides everything. And he's just like, I'm not sending, I'm not going to sacrifice the exocomps for Picard and Geordie's life. Holy shit, uh, Data. Uh, it's pretty big. And Riker loses his shit with Data. Well, and it's like, yeah. how I mean, many it's... times has Geordie and Picard saved your life and you're going to not send these robots in on the hypothesis that they're alive. Um, but eventually, the exocomps decide. Like, Data's like, the only way oh. we can do this is if we ask them. And if they volunteer to help, then that's fine. And they volunteer to save Picard and Geordi. And want to, one of them has to stay behind and chooses to stay behind to save the other two exocomps. It's so, so one of them dies and the other two survive and Picard and Geordi are, are safe. And it oh is like, it's God. such a great episode. And at the end, okay. like, Data and Picard have this heart to heart. And Picard's like, I understand why you did it. Holy shit. Holy shit. <laughs> Us talking about this should have never been a choice. Like, that. this conversation uh -huh. had to happen. I had no <laughs> idea. It makes so much sense that they would have had this backstory of Exocomp. Because I've never seen, I mean, I don't. I don't stop and think about the technology and think, oh, this relates to something. Mm -hmm. I don't. I didn't even know that that was a possibility. I hadn't. I hadn't even perceived to think while mm -hmm. watching this episode that there could be history. Which why I don't know. Oh, I was and, just and watching that means it. It kind of worked. It worked well as an episode then. But I liked it. Yeah. With that added richness of because the exocomps don't speak, they don't have language. So over the last fifteen years or something, there's obviously a lot more exocomps. They now can speak. They have universal translators built in as well. They are also being locked up. Uh-huh. Super because, sassy. Because, quote unquote, shit's gone wrong with the exocomp experiment. And we have like an exocomp prison. Uh-huh. They're building up to something huge. Like, um, I, I, with there's those like guys. an uprising with the exocomps. But it's like, man, it was, it's such a great episode. And it's such a great thing to call back to as well. Because as soon as you make, like, we're like society in general we're close to like as soon as we develop an ai that realizes it doesn't need us we are in so much trouble like they're building up to something because they've not only introduced a new warp capable population mm -hmm. in this episode they've also introduced a major villain to their mm. entire universe and that major problem that they have is even just joking around about just pinging the Borg for fun. Oh my goodness, so absolutely they have, could. They have a problem on their hands uh -huh. and clearly something has happened before because Starfleet's just locking up these little, mm -hmm. you know, what are they called? Exo? Exocomps. Exocomps. Yeah. So it would be interesting if down the line this new warp capable uh, population ends up saving Starfleet mm. from the problem because they've set up this massive weapon they clearly have that better they have ships access as well. to but it would be really interesting like just uh, like the it would be very ironic if they cause trouble and the solution to the trouble mm. is the community that rejected peanut technology. hamper the peanut hamper forced back yeah. in play because of what peanut hamper it would did. be very fitting so I'm, I'm curious how long the writers are thinking like because i started watching this episode thinking this is just a mindless episode this is just the, the writers oh, just needed a mental break you know uh -huh. like we all put out that script every once in a while that's just not the same as <laughs> you know, their best out. work or like, uh -huh. you know what, this paper, it, it isn't, it, I don't have to put in an extra 16 hours into it. Mm -hmm. It's just, it is what it is. And I'm, I was thinking, because I kind of felt like this episode 
could have been that. And the reason is because essentially this is a story of like, there's lots of different story elements going on in this, but you've got like a community that doesn't want to change, that is kind of resisting change, and then is essentially uh, comes to terms that change which pro- would probably be good, and there's mm-hmm. there's positivities to change, and then they do change, and then they're hurt. Mm-hmm. And so this is, and then you've also got the love conversations, but you know, under under all of that is Lower Deck's version of how to pull this episode off, and mm-hmm. I really like how they pull out something from TNG and like hyper focus on an exo comp and say, oh, that's great. let's, let's answer a lot of people's questions about this item mm. in the start. Uh, this, this, the universe that has so many things that they could pick mm. from in the Star Trek world, we're going to choose exo comp. And I thought that it was a throwaway episode until we got about, I don't know, 10 minutes towards the end, maybe even five mm. minutes towards the end. And then it would really started to pop for me. Like yeah. when this planet of owl creatures or whatever, starts to engage with the technology actually when the scavengers came to take the technology Mm -hmm. and then they got on that ship and that ship went into space and started shooting stuff i was like now i'm in there we go that was fun that looked really cool and so pretty like their new that new ship that looks like a bird Uh but it's not like the bird of prey so it's like a new bird oh it's so cool it's a little bit romulan-y but um yeah it's perfect design for them and the weapons were so pretty and the serena just gets beaten up again like i love the damage they show (laughs) on the ship like they they, they do that they kick the shit out of it yeah at the beginning Um, of this episode and in the end they showed it kind of in disrepair yeah um it's it's what lower decks does best for me and that is picking up the hanging threads from all of star trek because the best thing about tng and voyager is also the possibly the worst thing and it's that bottle episode nature of everything so the amount of aliens per week technologies per week disasters per week there is so many things that could be picked up on where you meet a species that's like developing a technology they they help um, something goes wrong they resolve it and never find that species again they never talk about that revolutionary application of that technology again and the Robodex is doing such a great job of picking up those references and saying so 15 years later where is that technology now what has happened to it how is it getting abused and now that we're in season three of its own show it's picking up on its own hanging threads so it's like this exocomp was just left flying in space because it refused to save the crew the Titan came in, saved the day, and got them out of trouble. And then we're all just like, huh, I wonder what happened to Peanut Hamper. And if it was <laughs> the days name. of TNG, there's a good chance that it never gets picked up. And we're just left to wonder where Peanut Hamper went. But I love that they, they pick up on it and revisit so what happened next. And I, I think they're going to do more of that. Because the, a, the, the AI that was next to Peanut Hamper at the very end of the episode the one where they're doing the zoom out and they said we're going to do horrible things together that ai is from another episode of lower decks i so was wondering they're gonna team up so that's voiced by jeffrey coombs who is uh, combs jeffrey combs who is legendary in star trek he's played i think he's appeared there's Majel barrett roddenberry who is the ship's computer she's appeared in the most episodes and the most different franchises jeffrey combs is very close because he plays an andorian in enterprise um a ferengi and a vorta in deep space nine i think he play he definitely plays somebody in voyager as well and i think he appears in an episode of tng so he just turns up as like a different alien every now and again he's so so great and he voices this evil ai as well so it was really really clever to put them together in the same place um yeah it's uh, i think we'll revisit them you're right this is just part of the fun we always say it every week that lower decks is just so great at and it's being able to animate some really fun things that either mm. are from the all the other previous iterations of Star Trek, but then even in its own story to kind of fold back in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think I can understand why people wouldn't like this episode, though. So even though I did like it, I spent most of the episode not liking it. But by yeah. the end, I liked it. And I think like as I was processing my own disinterest in what I was seeing at the time, mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, I can. I think I can understand why people would be like, this is... Like this is not my jam. Like, especially if you haven't seen the episode that Peanut Hamper was in. That previously I, which on, I haven't. 
Yeah, of course. Like that previous, I was really worried for you because hey, you haven't got the background of the exocomps. You haven't got the background nope. of the Lower Decks episode where Peanut nope. Hamper joined the crew. Nope. So I was like, is she going to think we skipped an episode? I did, like, actually. That, yeah, that yeah. previously on. I nearly messaged you saying, don't worry, this isn't previously on last week. This is previously two seasons ago or whatever. I figured it out. I yeah, did figure I it out you uh, pretty quickly because it was saying like time kind of went on and, I'm, mm. and I, you know, felt like... And even... Honestly, truly, a fun thing about the show that I could have completely believed is that there was never a previously on. They are mm. just getting us caught up on the pre-story yeah. to this episode and being clever about it. Like yeah. everyone expects that the previously on means that it was previously on for you to see. But what, mm. I can see this show turning that on its head and just saying, yeah. here's something that you didn't see and give us like a three minute synopsis leading mm. into the episode. I think that they're very clever writers and could definitely, you know, do mm. that. Um, but yeah, I didn't have the context of the 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 star of this episode mm -hmm. um, or how they got into that circumstance. And maybe that did play into some of what I wasn't enjoying. But even the humor didn't really hit on this one for me. But mm. I think it might be because, you know, I don't mind um, Mariner's sarcasm mm -hmm. and kind of her snarkiness. But Peanut Hamper is... <laughs> Peanut Hamper's a dick an absolute asshole and like <laughs> peanut hamper would be like maybe it's like certain people's spirit animal of star trek would be yeah. peanut hamper mm -hmm. you know that sort of idea that the the extreme ipsy within you becomes mm -hmm. some sort of a a character and i feel like P peanut hamper is sort of the pure vitriol for starfleet mm. vitriol for starfleet yeah in inside a show that they yeah. can kind of justify being there because mm -hmm. sh that thing just shits on everything well, especially it as a machine like there's always that whenever you talk about this argument so like data data early on in tng has to defend that he is alive and he is he has rights and that starfleet can't just take him apart and study him to build more and they make the argument like okay well what if the ship's computer decided i don't want to compute anymore like, what if right. a replicator said, I don't want to replicate anymore? Like, do we allow yeah. that to happen? And it's that fine line, like, where do we say sentience is happening? Where do we say that they're alive and have self-will? Like, can Data leave Starfleet? Like, can he just say, I quit, I'm going to go off right. and do something else? And eventually they say, yes, he can. But even, like, in the 24th century, they're not ready to have that discussion of, we've built this thing, can it now refuse to do the thing we built it to do? It's fascinating. It's one of the it is. best discussions in Star Trek because the ship's computer in particular is smarter than anything. Like, it is very intelligent and we're using it to plot courses and stuff. It's just that one yeah. step of self-awareness that it's missing. Well, it's it's and it's and also like point like this show is pointing out the, the, the dangers of that. Like, mm. we attached a replicator to a tiny machine Holy and sent shit, it out. It like, oh anything. my God. Uh -huh. There's that there's that scene in this ep uh, in this episode where uh Peanut Hamper is replicating a tennis ball and just throwing it against the wall yeah. because <laughs> da -doing. Da -doing. But it, you know, it's endless and where does this yeah. power come from and how is this thing still operational after all this time? And mm -hmm. these might be things that are explained within the, the technology, but nope. man, Star Trek made it happen and so now this is the consequence of having that. And so I that's ultimately why I like this episode mm -hmm. is I think that it's pushing at some of the ideals of some of the things that, that Star Trek has created. Mm -hmm. It's exploring the bad side of those and then presenting it in an, in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. So they're doing that instead of a complex storytelling, they're retelling a tale, you know, a tale that we've yeah. seen written not many, many times, which is outsider goes into a new village or, you know, and, and, and learns the ways and then turning it on its head again at the end that Pina Hamper was quote unquote dark all along mm -hmm. And, but not only just joking, but also did something pretty crazy yeah, pretty to, to up. get their way. Because she doesn't believe Kinda in organic worked. life. She doesn't believe that organic life is worth saving or thinking about. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just an annoying kind of, you know, inconvenience. And yeah. I don't mind seeing that, but peanut hamper, peanut hamper it was hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and some of the story stuff was kind of like, I, okay, sure. Yep. Let's go for the third laugh on the sex scene. Let's try for that. Yeah, you know, so there's, like, there's a lot of like, oh, how does a bird have sex with a robot <laughs> jokes? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and sometimes um, that was clever, but a mm -hmm. lot of times I was like, I think I know why I'm people done don't now. like it. Yeah. I think that, yeah. I'm so... I've got two thoughts. One is that this is incredible storytelling for me. Like, this, mm -hmm. it's so, so clever. It's pulling 
pulling at something that we know, diving deeper into it. It's creating a new thing and then, hey, how would we interact with that new thing and how would it go wrong? The the reason I love this episode is because it does follow the formula of some of the less popular Star Trek episodes. So a little bit throwaway, a little bit, hey, what's this tertiary character doing? And it's inconsequential to the wider universe and it's like when we do a lower decks episode on the next generation and it's just like these people don't matter there's an adventure happening but we're focusing on the the other people so it's kind of a bit throwaway but for me this fixes that in the last five minutes by Mm. that awesome twist of peanut hamper being evil all along and sending the message because i didn't see the twist coming i thought oh we're going to show that they're they're not evil all along and they're fine but for them to be like evil through and through like one dimensional <laughs> just no 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 self-serving like i do not care super about the self-serving I, and I think that's why it's evil is because there's no mm. room for other the other I, side for anything this is just i'm gonna be all about my own interests and for a time starfleet was great because it got me away from my father but now starfleet wants me to do things i don't want to do so i'm gonna leave and for me it's saved by that last five minutes because it then makes it consequential it makes like this this big this bad this villain that is probably going to come back again um this new species with uh new technology it it didn't just like end with a well all's well that ends well it's peanut hamper is now back in the in the world and you have to live with the consequences of what of what that means or what the exocomps are so i think it just fixed that throwaway episode thing by adding some stakes at the end it did and it did that for the scavengers too like you Mm. think they're kind of done but then they actually go get the ship and fly it yeah it's great and while that's absolutely sinful and we'll get to that here in a minute Mm -hmm. like that was like i didn't expect that and mm. I also w- should have been expecting the son to get his own ship and go out as well. Mm. I didn't, I wasn't thinking about that at the time. I was just kind of like along for the ride again, which is when I know that I'm having fun mm. is when I'm not yeah. thinking about what I'm watching any longer. So they kind of kept digging in and finding new ways to tell kind of the the story. Mm-hmm. And it made, made me think at the end. But I do think that a lot of time was spent on the with facade. peanut hamper. Yeah. yeah. In that world. And really that's selling okay. the deception. Yeah. Um, I do also wonder, just as people who produce content for a living, it's like there's always that, what do they call it, the bottle episode for TV. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's there's sometimes when you just you shift into a different gear. Yeah. Another thing people might not like about this is that it doesn't have our main crew. Yeah, in I get that. It. And, and people it's, often it's butt against missing that. when we do that. They butt against it because it's like, why am I watching Lower Decks if I'm not watching my favorite people? But that's yeah. never really bugged me as much. It used to bug me when I was younger. I get it. Here's what I love about this. They have the chance to do that. The actors all get a break for whatever reason, whether it's a technical thing, like Mm. scheduling just requires to do something different this episode. But also for someone like myself who didn't know Peanut Hamper was a thing, it's Mm. like, oh, like, who is this? What? It's a it's an extra waste of time. Mm -hmm. Now, knowing what I know, I love it even more because it's really digging into the history of Star Trek. And I don't want to repeat myself too much, but there are things to like about this and, yeah. and there are some things to, to I not. I get why people have come down on, no, this wasn't for me. This is a departure. This was a miss. And other people are like, I love it. This is so clever. And I'm definitely in the this is clever camp. Did you say the both things you're thinking? Um, no, the oh, I have loads more, loads more little okay, thoughts. Good. But the, good. the other one I had was that you're just really quickly, you're going to love watching that episode now because you'll see the exocomps live action as well. I love that you're seeing some things for the first time on Lower Decks animated and then you'll get to see them live action because usually that's the way it goes is I love this animated thing. I want to see a live action version, but Lower Decks is reversing that and having to animate our favorite live action things. So I think the the Exocomp episode is definitely higher up on the list of our rewatches. And I also appreciate seeing things done with the technology that existed at the time because it's not yeah. like I'm getting oh, a live you'll be action blown away by this. in in current technology. Uh-huh. I'm getting a live action in 90s mm-hmm. or 60s or whatever and it's really fun. I I don't mind the old sci-fi mm. movies, you know, seeing people flying in and you can easily see the wire or yeah. like the really lame explosions or just like, you know, in Star Trek, the models that they're using and stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't mind seeing that stuff because it's it's theater of the mind. And while I'm geared to look at those things in a way, 
Mm. I love I love watching how things used to be done. But you're right. I, I am a little lucky in that I'm seeing these. I, it's it's cool for me because I didn't know that something inspired it to exist on screen. First. I couldn't wait to tell you because I was like, it's clear <laughs> this is referencing Lower Decks, but it is not clear that it's referencing TNG. No, and isn't I that great storytelling? That I like it's it. It's so great. It's like cheers to the team that's putting this together. It's so fun. It's so great to watch this with you because... I my barometer is way off of whether does this work as an episode without any prior knowledge and nine times out of ten it feels like they work for you as episodes in their own right even without extensive background knowledge I, just I agree. clever storytelling but my first notes were previously on wait what and then wait, all what? in all caps peanut hamper <laughs> what is going on so they try to come up with like a name because I don't I think peanut hamper doesn't have a name when they arrive on the Cerritos and they're coming up with all of these great names and it's just like peanut hamper I like that one it's like okay fine the exocomp is called peanut hamper is one of the things that you liked about this episode things like so at the very beginning of this episode peanut hamper says something like there um there's no way they're not going to scan for non-organic life (laughs) no way that would happen this episode is filled with kind of those because again peanut hamper's character is the most nitpickiest asshole oh it's absolutely sinning star trek yeah yeah and starfleet so Mm -hmm. as a fan are you enjoying that that voice is in this episode really strongly it's one of my favorite things about lower decks i i absolutely love it so um it's like sometimes it's not about the needs of the many sometimes it's about the needs of the me (laughs) i love that because there's so much one of my favorite lines was um hey why are you calling it a sky snake if everything flies on this planet wouldn't it just Mm -hmm. be a snake a snake my universal translator can't make your language not dumb like because because the immediate argument is well wouldn't aren't you blaming the translator for whatever word that bird said translating it into sky snake but if the translator is smart enough to still pick up that their word for sky was put in front of snake it's so so clever like it's that the this hard this show would be so hard to sin and it is so hard to sin because it is constantly sinning itself in such a loving way um so yeah the peanut hamper would be excellent at cinema sins all day long but no i i enjoy it because the more self aware you can be about that stuff the more everybody's in on the joke everybody knows and you can get along with it like when it's hidden and like brushed under the carpet for me it's harder to stay in the universe but when yeah. we address it in universe that's my sweet spot of okay everybody knows this is ridiculous my brain is now more comfortable enjoying it which i know is a me thing ridiculous and also just points out like for example not scanning for non-organic life that's Mm -hmm. the show saying hey we need to be aware like aware that there is other kinds of life and it's really i I liked that part of this episode the reminder that in this universe ai is like a conscious yeah decision making entity that needs to be respected and they're showing that with the dolphins too in their lingo oh my goodness. just pointing out like hey how... would you have to scan for dolphin life <laughs> right and it's 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 constantly pointing out how up its own ass it is about being mm. human and being human shaped or, yeah. or thinking organically Absolutely. so i i love that because as a person on planet earth that needs to constantly be reminded that it's not all about me it's mm-hmm. nice to watch something that calls into question like hey are you aware that you're not the center of the universe and yeah, I like especially it. a show like star trek which it's it's mo is acceptance and accept everybody in every form it still fell into the trap of humans being the center of everything and the the starfleet being the good guys and it's one of the best lines in the undiscovered country is when they're all at dinner and uhura or Chekhov says where's um oh what's like where do you have no humanity or something and the klingons are like what are you talking about humanity i'm a klingon like you dick yeah. like yeah what are you, human rights like it was it's awkward alien but right. it's so awkward but it's such a great <laughs> thing to point out yeah something I else love i it. loved about this episode that it that it did was the title card was yes. changed yes that was my how next thing. unique was that i loved it and i can see why people didn't like it maybe but i love that you mess with the title cards and i'm all there <laughs> like the music was more dramatic yeah and, and kind of softer softer and it was shorter just to show us the journey of peanut hamper really really clever time saving device as well to show that she's been floating around for for a long time there's something really important about um consistency 
mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. storytelling it's because the audience, yes, then they trust you. Like there's a reason that at the beginning, like with it, even in this show, we tell you where the segments are because then you're mm-hmm. like, oh, I know where we are on the show. And that gives you a sense of place yeah. in the world. And it, it's a very important part of us in being humans. Like we look for those codes and those patterns for survival. Same with entertainment. We want to know where we're going. So I can see how also changing that would immediately make a portion of people uncomfortable mm-hmm. just instinctively might have not m- might not even know why but you're just like waiting for that sound that you know or you that are. visual cue that, that you know when you, yeah. yeah when you don't have it you're like what was that but for me i thought it was a really beautiful artistic expression i liked it i it's when you mess with stuff that isn't in the show I love it because then your talk is so like the characters don't know that there are opening credits. They don't know that what they've just experienced is a cold (laughs) open and then there's the credits and then the show. So for me, it's a chance to directly speak to the audience. Um, 24 did it in a great way when somebody would die and at the end of an episode, you weren't too sure the opening credits would be silent. So there would be no theme music, no nothing. And the clock that ticked at the end wouldn't have a people because you know it's like you know the character has wow. died a moment of silence and that's directly speaking to the audience i love that and sometimes like house would do something funky with the opening credits where they would change the music and it's like oh shit this episode is going to be serious different. because something you different. haven't used the upbeat yeah. music so yeah, for me right. i love that I it's love another it so element much. of storytelling and mm-hmm. when you have a group of people that's creating something and they're all aware that every second is a chance to enhance storytelling it's yeah. a really cool it really um, is. Did you see the Rutherford mask floating in space at the beginning? No, I didn't. There was, so right right at the opening credits, I think it yeah. was maybe even in the opening credits section, there was this face device floating in space and it had yeah. like a, a Vulcan ear on it on one side and then it had oh, like a little visor over half of it. So, and I wrote down, did you see the face thingy <clears> that's floating in space? Is that Rutherford's thing? It does remind me that Rutherford did lose it. Like he did... There's something that happened and it was pulled off of his face in an episode. And I think it was this episode. So it makes sense because yeah. it seemed to happen after the explosion. Yeah, I think, that, in okay. fact, I'm certain it is because when Peanut Hamper says, oh my God, that person died and that was going to be me, that's Shax. So Shax eventually, eventually sacrifices himself to save the Cerritos. And then two episodes later, he's back and nobody explains why. And the lower deckers are like, wait, Shax is back? How did that happen? And it's just, it hits home that the A-team have been on an adventure and rescued and resurrected Shax, but we never find out how because we're the B-team. We don't know. We weren't part of that adventure. So he just turns up and they're just like, what the fuck? (laughs) Where did Shax come from? Oh my God. It's so great. Well, I saw that. And to me, in an episode like this, I wonder if it's a wink and nod, like this device is also going to float out into the middle of God knows where and mm, end up accidentally influencing an entire you know thing yeah. and also and and if he's lost that visor that means those weird memories and glitches and control stuff might actually still be alive for someone else to pick up later it could be it could i mean if they pick that up i would love it that's amazing something that's going to blow your mind danae it's I'm one, ready. Of the, one of the occasions where we've accidentally predicted something completely by fluke i blew my mind when this happened in the episode so insurrection the movie that I referenced this in the beginning of the show, and that's where I pulled your quote from. Oh, yeah. Your introduction. <gasps> no, you didn't do something. I, People will never big. believe that we no, record we were... those out of order. They'll never believe you. People will assume that we saw the episode, did the intro, but we did the intro, watched the episode, and then we come back. So the plot of Insurrection, very, very briefly, is that Data goes rogue, and he's on a planet doing some like archaeological archaeological stuff and studying a species that hasn't got warp travel yet. Stop and he's, it. He's undercover, he's invisible, they're studying everybody. Eventually there's an accident and he gets exposed and goes a bit rogue. And they're all worried. The Enterprise turns up and they're like, well, what are we going to do? Because we've exposed these people to technology. Nope. These people already no! had technology. They, they traveled the stars and... And then they got into too many wars, so they rejected the technology and live no. a simple farming life. <laughs> no fucking way. You are so right. That blows my fucking it's mind. It's fucking <gasps> sane. So I'm like... That's crazy, wait, Ian. This is the plot to Insurrection. Just we are in, lower in a fucking episode. simulation We're right now. This isn't real. <laughs> 
that's crazy but that's so it's fucking insane. cool too because it's a perfect it's, perfect. it's a perfect tie into this episode it's perfect exa- tie-in. <laughs> that is exactly this episode it's this episode it's the perfect tie-in i couldn't have made oh it up and yet i did it's so so my the reason i remembered that was because in my in my sins i wrote down well, I guess this is just the cliche of, oh, we've corrupted a planet, but it's fine because it turns out they already had technology, exactly. so no harm, no foul. And then I was like, wait, no, that's exactly what happens in Insurrection. <laughs> oh my God. Wild. A- I accidentally predicted this episode. It's crazy. <sighs> Did you laugh during this there. episode? Uh, no, there was a couple of times I laughed. I laughed Did you? when... Um, Oh, I laughed when I laughed with the tennis ball thing because that's a reference okay. to the Great Escape. Um, because like he's in isolation and he's just throwing the tennis ball against the wall. I laughed with um, Sharon the the peanut hamper rock thing because that's a Castaway reference. Um, so I I love that. That made me laugh. There was something else that made me chuckle. Oh, it was when Birdman starts crying. And she's just like, oh, yeah, here we go. He fucking cries at everything. Even after we've made love. <laughs> yeah, he's um, crying. I'm out. Man, I almost laughed. They, they, she was like, pretend falling in love. And she's like, mm. sing for me, Birdman. And oh, there's this so much. silent beat. <laughs> and they're flying up in the sky. And there's just this silent beat. And I'm like, are they going to cut away to the next scene? Like, it's just been just a split second mm-hmm. long enough. Something. What is this? And he goes, it was like this horrible sound i laughed so much i almost laughed i it it was good but i was like what is going on and because we're right in the middle of this love Uh story and i guess like the kickoff of this love story and i was i wasn't prepared for for that like i was (laughs) i was ready i was like this is mike mcmahon wanting to write a song in star trek this is his chance i'm sure he's dying to do this it could have gone into a musical yeah i'm prepped for a disney song about love and then there's the deep breath the swelling and then fuck (laughs) it killed me killed me yeah oh you're still singing no that's horrible please stop (laughs) yeah the other time so, that happens is when um, they they do the town meeting and everyone is arguing and then like this big eagle chord just goes Quack! like just to get everyone to stop arguing and it was so dramatic. I was like, that's exactly what these birds would do. It's great. Yeah, yeah. She was adapting into their whole entire world. I love it. How did you respond to the lovemaking scene? My notes were this. Oh, uh, oh, we're 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 going there. We're having Showing- a sex scene. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and then it was um. Note to self, I'm sort of glad that this is one occasion where Ian and I are not watching this together in the same room. Though <laughs> oh, I do cool. wonder what his face is looking like right now. Is he like confused, concerned? Just what like what what was going through your mind when we have this pretty detailed like lead into a sex scene mm-hmm. that includes them trying to figure out how their parts are gonna fit together? Yeah, yeah. Like what, was, how was that for you? <laughs> this is me knowing that Lower Decks can do things that Star Trek can't. So it is adult. It will have the shits and the fucks and the swears. And it can do the dirtier things. Like, this is a little bit of escapism. So I'm fine with it. It's not my favorite thing because it's a bit weird. But right? it's inside of Star Trek. This is the perfect little biome for it to happen inside of Star Trek. Yeah. The, the thing that really got me was like the his tongue going inside her like replicator slot Hole. thing and i was like uh-huh. who who's getting anything out of that like who's who's enjoying that situation uh, somebody thinks that that's super funny yeah. or did, did peanut hamper like replicate a tongue inside the hole to like may and how did that not fall out eventually uh-huh. or move cuz also something that happened was a tear away of clothing in her examining his parts quote yeah our pieces are so different. How mm-hmm. are they going to fit together? And while I love this convers- this awkward pre-sex conversation because it happens in real life too, and it it, it is a very wild experience mm-hmm. sometimes, I'm like, okay, did we need that? And then they went there again, but quicker, and that was appreciated because I'm yeah, like, please yeah, don't, get it please with. don't try to push this humor beat a, like further. Too, yeah, um, we get it. And then they said something like, come There is something I must show you. And I just wrote down round two. Please, God, no. (laughs) (laughs) Please, no. Please, no. Please, no. (laughs) To be fair, she could probably replicate a device that would pleasure an individual. Something was happening in that heart-shaped wing thing. We don't know. I just don't know what peanut hamper is getting out of it, to be honest. Uh, Nothing except that's the the thing is probably nothing. Probably Mm -hmm. just trying to figure out 
what do I have to do to have fun here? And maybe yeah. just messing with creatures. Well, it makes so much more sense when we know that they're playing it up to, uh, I guess, a full sense of security. <laughs> yeah. I suppose. Although, you know, she, it Warm ends space. up working in her favor because, yeah. or their favor, because Peanut Hamper finds technology and is able to find a way to yeah. get off of this planet. Rather That's than so stealing funny. the technology herself, calling for backup to get back in with Starfleet, which she doesn't actually care about. I guess that's a sin, but I'll... Yeah, uh, I don't know why she's really That's an early sin back. for me. Just yeah. remember I said it, because I don't want to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, did you notice the literal turtle doves? So no. Because everything on the planet is flying. One of the mm -hmm. cutaways, when they're about to do the business, is like these <sighs> turtles that are flying out. And I was like, well, flying turtle... Turtle doves. Damn it. Turtle doves. Damn it, Dyson, did you buy this? Yeah. Um, my last little throwaway point was that I love that Boimler was unable to pronounce the planet name because there's this like thing where no matter how complicated the planet is, everyone can pronounce it. And he's like, Ariolus, Ariola, Ariola. It's a pre-war planet. <laughs> <laughs> Abole, abole, yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Nope. Oh, man. Any final thoughts? Um, If I wanted to say anything and super emphasize my favorite part of this episode and one of the biggest Maybe I could even say the only reasons that this would be recommend for me pretty strongly on mm -hmm. an episode that's probably controversial. It is to see the cool spaceship and technology because it does this really cool weapon thing where it sort of mm. fires up electric electricity, like it yeah. pops in some sort of taser. Uh -huh. And then the electricity pops together in the middle, creates a cool like beam ball. Yeah. And I think I think after the son takes over the ship and he has that command central looking mm -hmm. thing, which was awesome, he sort of like caws out and it oh. made me wonder if the technology of the ship is powered by their vocal capabilities, would which would be cool. really cool for a bird. Yeah. And it just blasts out this energy wave. And I'm thinking this is a cool looking thing. And I know I said it earlier, but it was beautiful to look at. Mm -hmm. um and one of the my favorite parts was just like man this is this this is the rebirth of a warp capable society and yeah. we don't get to see that every single time we watch I, star trek i love starship porn i love it it's one it's of my so favorite pretty. things just new aliens new starships it doesn't all have to be laser beams like there can be some inventive weapons as well yeah i love that yeah it was super cool Okay, well, we've gushed on that way more than I expected, actually, and I think I like that episode even more than I thought I did. Um, yeah, it's doing some good stuff. Cool. Well, with that, it's time to head to engineering. For this instance, is futile. Bird stations, everyone. Warning: warp core collapse in ten seconds. This is the part of the show where we re-engage our sin birds, remind ourselves that no TV bird is without sin, even our beloved star birds. Danae, you go first. Ooh, um, yeah, I just, it's it's the coolest ship that you've ever seen, and it looks awesome, but how does he know how to fly it? That's yeah, maybe... Yeah, it's the ancestors, yeah. It seems like both the scavengers and the bird people both wouldn't have an understanding of how to fly completely mm. ancient technology no that clue. doesn't just scan you and then work for you, right? Maybe it maybe does. Maybe it does. Maybe I don't it know. does. It's, but it seems pretty sinful to me. No, that's pretty sinful. I mean, just the fact that the ship still works as well. Has it been in like low power saving mode or something? Like you managed to break orbit and all weapons and it apparently can be piloted by one bird as well. Just <laughs> one, one, one person. Just that's one it. confident cock. Yep. Cock! Firing phases exactly where you want them to fire. Exactly. And not at the Cerritos, Everything goes perfect. Which could also be a threat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you know? Oh, you, you know which one is what? Cool, I guess. Of course you do. That's fine. Um, my very, very first sin was that it's pretty bloody lucky that Peanut Hamper on her little makeshift warp thing, which I love, just one nacelle and then point three of warp, <laughs> manages to land anywhere near a fucking planet. Do we know how far apart planets is? Like, it's called space, not things, because there's a lot of space out there between the things, or else it would be called things. Um, it's very lucky that she gets anywhere near a planet, let alone a planet with life on it, let alone near the life on that planet. <laughs> One of my sins leading up to that moment was at the previously on section where Peanut Hamper is out in space observing the shenanigans that it's going on and mm -hmm. we're kind of getting an idea for personality, etc. But she can hear them as they're exclaiming and screaming from the ship. But I don't think that you'd be able to do that in space, but I have no. never been there before, so... <laughs> Unless it's on a comm channel and she's listening Maybe. in, perhaps. It sounded like it was in the distance. Like they were going for yeah. the in the distance thing. Uh -huh. Anyway. Mm -hmm. I, it sound does not, it 
does not travel in a vacuum or it does but it can't be her i don't know whatever it shouldn't work um we kind of mentioned this but i really don't know like i know the exocomps have a great power cell ability but is it good enough that you can just replicate tennis balls willy-nilly like that still feels like a lot of energy is being used to create a thousand tennis balls yep conserve some power dude a uh, silly one for me would be when peanut hamper is asking to have her chin scratched well she says actually go <laughs> to the other side like yeah. get the left side too but then he actually goes to her chin and i mm-hmm. that's an easy sin for just to be like that's not her left side and just have yeah. a fun silly you sin in asshole why are you ignoring her <laughs> we i mean we have just a just a reminder as writers for everything wrong with kind of style yes. Like you're finding things that are wrong. Like, for example, how would this person know how to fly this ship, this ancient ship? Mm-hmm. That's kind of one that's an easy ask where people can kind of nod along being like, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, exactly. But we also send stupid shit like not scratching the left side of the chin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We have to get the silly stuff in there. Um, there are also a lot of ships out there in the galaxy. So it's very lucky that Peanut Hamper's distress, distress call was only picked up by the Cerritos or the Cerritos is the only one that responded. Like, And they were basically within a few hours distance away from the planet. Like, That's a big reach. That would be sinned a lot. A lot, a lot. A lot, a lot. Um, uh, One of my fun sins that I'll go with too is watching all of these adorable creatures like hatching and these owl Aww. people i think it would be kind of a fun moment to say like what is this star trek's attempt attempt at a new merch grab you know like yeah <laughs> releasing Adorable in time with hatchings. this episode or just all of these mm-hmm. aorias or whatever yeah <laughs> yeah i love the, the the none of the parents would be ready for the kids and i was like no we haven't decorated yet we thought we had another month like mm-hmm. don't we're not ready for this hatchling also we wanted to be present for the birth <laughs> amazing uh, i only had i'm sure there's more but i only had one really really big one and it's the cliche at the end that um when they still think that peanut hamper saved the day they're just like yeah you can rejoin starfleet you can come on board like the good there's this cliche that the good thing you did as long as that was more recent it wipes out the bad <laughs> thing that you did as long as you do them in the right order that's fine i literally wrote down the same thing yeah. my sin is um so you saw Peanut do something cool and did a great job. So yeah, no punishment for you. <laughs> no punishment like, for abandonment. And it it works in the reverse as well because um, Picard will always be, like when he's in the middle of trouble, he'll be ignored despite all of the good things he's done. So it's like, so you value him, he saved the galaxy, but now because he's inconvenient, you're, gonna, you're going to ignore him. Mm-hmm. So it's always you're as good as your most recent performance is the, the cliche. Yep. I think I would sin explaining your plan. Like, so the scavengers show up. And my first question when I was watching it was like, why are you telling them what you're doing? You know, if you want to do something, just do it. Like, they're like, hi, we're here because da 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 Uh-huh. Just transport it up. You already have permission. uh, They did. Well, yeah, they think they have permission, which you find out later. So then my sin changes to why aren't you mentioning that you were allowed to come here in that (laughs) first initial speech? Oh, I I recognize your voice. Oh, uh, hey, we, we got your call. We're here to pick up the something. Would instantly yeah. clear it up. Now, it's for the sake of the twist and the storytelling, and that's totally fine yeah. because I enjoyed I enjoyed it in the moment. And I think that you need to have those moments so that the brain can have fun and the storytelling mm-hmm. can have fun. But in retrospect, it's like that's the first thing you would say is, hey, got yeah. your transmission. Here we are to pick up the junk. Yeah, thank you. Here's my stuff. Um, I don't really think I have much more, to be completely honest. Do you have any others? I just have one there's when everything is going to shit at the end the um you know the owl son says something along the lines of soon there will be no home left to save and i'm like yes and why are we walking why are we talking right now why are we <laughs> doing go. something like, is that perfect example of someone telling you that they're in danger while not doing anything about their danger yes. <laughs> I, I think that'd be like yes and we are lacking some very serious like urgency right now let's do it stop talking so. more doing yeah. One thing I've noticed is that our assistant sections for Lower Decks are quite short. And for very, Picard, very short. it was like Super most of long. the show. Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. I wonder now, though, if I would feel differently about Picard. I kind of no. want to do a rewatch at some point in time. We can. We can definitely. But I, I, I think the evidence speaks for itself. And I love Picard in its own way. But Lower Decks is top tier new really good stuff really really good really stuff good. i'm loving it so much 
um well that's it i think that was an awesome episode um thank you for listening everybody there is you will have noticed there was no live show on twitch this week but we will be back um next week uh, monday at 12 p.m central on twitch to do episode eight um so yeah thanks for listening everybody it's squawk from me <laughs> And it's, uh, well, I, okay, so you did the squaw, which is essentially for the flock, which is Yes, great. for the flock! So I'll do uh, it, and it is, um, smell you later, literally, because you all shit everywhere <laughs> from me. <laughs> we are talking directly to you. And live long and podsper. Thanks for listening. Want to connect with the show? Our hailing frequencies are always open through captainspod at cinemasins.com. Like, comment, and subscribe on your podcast player of choice, and be sure to visit cinemasins.com. And thank you for joining us as we take As we burrito, cerrito. Okay, why are there owls on the thumbnail? It's like Wookie owls. What is that? What is that? Be out! Be out! Right, much love. Bye-o. See you soon. Do you mean to stop recording? Um, no, just keep it running, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, bye. Into the unknown. Well, my morning, bless him, was helping Aaron Dicer um, because he has some new brackets for like his monitors. So he's got like, there's a monitor up here now and a monitor in front of me. But to get it off of the stand and to put it onto the bracket, he had to unscrew it from the stand. But one of the screws was rounded off. So bless him, he spent two hours yesterday trying to unscrew it and use pliers. I tried for half an hour this morning until I got a hammer. Whoa. And then I just got a hammer and a flat-headed screwdriver. And Holy shit. Sheared the top of the screw head off. And then it worked. <gasps> oh my gosh. Uh uh-huh, it's the most manly thing I've ever done. I was like, Aaron, like we have like ten different sizes of pliers, all of these different screwdrivers. So I said, Aaron, do you have a hammer? <laughs> and he's just like Let's go to the nope. next level. <laughs> nope. <laughs> How about a saw? There is no problem a hammer cannot uh, solve. That's that's not true. You just need to use a bigger hammer. Or your imagination. My imagination would not have helped in this. I could not imagine the screw loose. I meant use your imagination in ways to use a hammer. Oh, got it. Well, I did, to be fair. <laughs> I used it to hammer the screwdriver into the screw. We're all on the same page. A hammer was a very bad slash good idea. My hammer. That's the one. That's the one. Oh, yeah. I love to hear my things, you know. It's my favorite thing. You know. You know. I was watching a Moco Maid uh, stream a couple days ago. Mm-hmm. No, it was like, oh, like a week ago, maybe. And they have this point redemption on Twitch uh-huh. that is fascinating. It's like pronounce a word. Oh, yes. Yeah. It was so funny. This word was absolutely fucking crazy. Uh huh. I can't remember it. And maybe it's best I don't because it was anxiety inducing. But uh-huh. essentially what you do is you open up your Google browser, you type the word in and then you hit the pronounce yeah. thing and you could hear it pronounced. Yeah. Slow it down a little bit. I think it was like a 12 syllable word. Uh huh. And then you press the microphone button Uh huh. and Google listens to how you are pronouncing it. Yeah. And tells you where you're wrong. Okay, yeah. And the goal is to get it 100% right. Okay. 90 minutes. You it spent- took them 90, oh, no, them, no. 90 minutes to get this word. Oh, wow. So it was Devin leaning in mm-hmm. and saying this word, and then it's showing you where the errors are. And then Derek leaning into the microphone back and forth That's for really 90 funny. minutes until oh. they both got it. And 90 so, minutes that's a mm-hmm. long time it was crazy so i <laughs> i was trolling them of course and i said well i'm gonna try it so i recorded my screen on my computer and then i pretended like i did it uh-huh. and then i linked them in the chat to the video and said like well Nailed it. looks like so- looks like someone can get it on the first try and they're like no and they pulled it up and then i just totally botched it oh yeah yeah you butchered it <laughs> nice the chat is just exploding with excitement. And there's some people in there who are Babs fans. Oh, nice, nice. And they're like, they want to hear Babs say it. So I recorded oh, no. Babs saying it and sent it to him. It was oh, so I great. But she fucked it up completely. She did pretty good, actually. Yeah. And then she ended up with motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> motherfucker.
Okay, this is Bab saying it. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Yep. I said, no, sir, no, you're the purification, motherfucker. Nice. She got pretty close. I think she did better than you did. Flossinosa something something something. Flossification, motherfucker. Motherfucker. Flossinosa nylophilification. Yeah, Flossinosa nylophilification. Flossinosa nylophilification. Got it. Flossinosa nylophilification. Nylophilification. Flossinosa nylophilification. Flossinosa nylophilification. Flossinosa nylophilification. Flossinosa nylophilification. But what you have to do is you actually have to hit the button and then Google tells you if you got it. That's and so Google good. is like sometimes you know they're saying flossinosa, but they're mm -hmm. not pronunciating the f very well. And yeah, so it's huh? saying that they said S instead. Oh, and like, no. I didn't say that. And it was just literally 90 minutes of them getting every single thing correct. Flossinosa nylophilification. Flossinosa nylophilification. Flossinosa nylophilification. There you go. Nice. But you have to do it according to Google for this. Yeah, of course. Floss the nose, the pillification. Oh, yeah. Showing sure off now, you can sing that. Floss the nose, which sounds like something from Fifth Element. No, sir. Floss in Paradise, I think, was the name of the planet. Oh, is I haven't seen Fifth Element in so long. I obsessed over that movie when it came out. That is a that is a nerd that I haven't <laughs> dipped my toes into. I've only seen it once. That's the one with. Um, uh, Chris Mila Jovovich it, and Chris Tucker. Is it Chris Tucker maybe. that plays the crazy guy? Maybe. With the hair? I don't think he's crazy, but yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, and Bruce Willis. And yes. what was strange about that is when I saw that movie, I was like, I think that Bruce Willis is really handsome, and I'm really oh, yeah. into this guy, yeah. right? But I couldn't figure out where I knew him before. And for a while, I thought there's no way this is the first time I've seen Bruce Willis in a movie. Uh huh. Yeah, I had to have seen him before this. What year and then I realized later on that when I was little, somebody played Death Becomes Her. Oh, yeah. He's in that movie. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. Look at that young Bruce Willis face. Uh -huh. And that movie freaked me the fuck out when I was little. Let me tell you. Oh, I bet. Holy shit. Got pieces of like that somebody has a up. hole in their body. Yeah. And they're uh, shooking, fucking paint they're, peeling off their face and shit. One of them, like their head gets twisted around. Twisted I around. Think. Yeah. Yeah. It was. That movie's I mean, messed it's a, up. It's kind of a fun premise for a movie, though. Oh, yeah, for, for sure. No, like, I really, like, honestly, I really like it, but it is messed so up. Clever. It's a bit Tim Burton-y. Uh-huh. But yeah, um, so Fifth Element was 1997, so he'd been in loads of stuff. He'd, like, done yeah, I couldn't remember. two or three Die Hard. No, two Die Hards by this point. I've never seen a seen Die Hard. Those, no. But he no. was in a TV show first, um, like a I sitcom. I didn't watch CT. <laughs> no, no, no. But anyway, I was only I was only allowed to watch Disney movies, which uh -huh. is why I become such a beautiful princess. Uh, did you know, like, if I said, "Man, you're looking yoke today," what does that mean? Maybe a little bit um, undone, a little runny, a oh, little. Okay, good. So it doesn't immediately pop into your head as a saying. No, because I got back to the yoke. house yesterday, and one of Aaron's kids said, "Ian, you were looking mighty yoke." <laughs> Sorry, is that like swole? Is that like yeah, strong? Like as in oh, like you can carry the fit. yoke of a like a yak, like a yoke. Exactly yeah. like that. But I was just like, I'm looking eggy. Like yeah, I went to egg too. Yeah, I was. <laughs> are, you, are you saying I don't look well? <laughs> like, well, what are you trying to say about me? And Thank like, you. No, yolk. So I was like, well, how do you spell that? Y o k e. And he's like, no, 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 it's y o l k. So it's even spelled like egg yolk. Like, Here well. it is. It's Jurassic Park. It's a massive park. What could possibly go wrong? I've got a cup of tea. It's made with milk and three sugars. It was so nice in my belly. Then they would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a tea? 